My name's Brian Heffernan. I'm a member of the Taxi Charity for Military Veterans. Last summer, we visited eight of these veterans of Operation Market Garden, which took place in September 1944. And these are their stories. In 1941, there was notices put up. Volunteers wanted for home on forces. So me and another man, as I knew well, we both volunteered for home on forces. We were stationed in Swanage in Dorchester at the time. And we went to Dorchester for an interview and uh, had an interview. And then two weeks after, we were posted to the 1st Battalion of Ward Regiment in what they call T Company. And you did five weeks special training to prove your fitness. And after the five weeks, you were accepted. And then you went in one of the companies of the border regiment. We finished up in North Africa and we went on the invasion of Sicily, which was a complete disaster. That was a glider born invasion. And uh, from there, back to North Africa. And then when Italy turned turtle on Germany, we went and served four months in Italy. Then we came back to England just before Christmas 43 and uh, got ready. We were brought home to, in anticipation of what would be D-Day. And what was never, we was briefed, I believe, after D-Day for about 14 operations. And they, to cancel the operation, somebody from the guard room would come in and shout in the middle of the night and allow the Fabian three or four times, and Fabian was the code word for operations being cancelled. And then uh, probably about the 15th of September, uh, we didn't get this word Fabian, so we knew we was bound for a place called Arnhem. Probably not, nobody ever, we didn't even know it was in Arnhem, the worry was. And the 17th of September, on the typical September day, misty morning, beautiful afternoon, we flew in this huge convoy of gliders and uh, made a very safe landing near the uh, psychotics but at Lencombe and uh, from there after about three hours guarding the dock zone, the Paris had docked then, then our job in B Company was to go through the villages of Eelsum into Rencombe and uh, overrun them. Very little opposition going, we shot two little loads of soldiers up and, but during the night, a force of Germans got between us and the, the river, and forged in it, they mustn't have been no, so they didn't get exactly to the river. And we were shelled and mortared during the night and the day, to, with a few people killed there. And then we had orders state from General Urquhart's headquarters, which were pulled back, back to Oosterby. And, uh, that's where we spent all the rest of our time, moving and moving and moving, and beating off attacks, being shelled and mortared for days on end. And uh, uh, we kept wondering when the Allied forces had reached us. But uh, my platoon officer told me one night that the distance between where we were and that Nijmegen the Germans had cut it off by heavy anti-tank weapons during the night, so there could be no movement. And at the end of the ninth or tenth day, we'd been squashed in and in and in. We were in a small perimeter, what was left of us, and surrounded by the Germans. The fourth side was the river, so they decided nothing more could be done. And uh, the old, when the evacuation of the from the Canadian engineers over the Nether Rhine, they hoped that the Germans would think there were reinforcements coming in. And uh, I think I was posted to a position near where Kate to Horse house was, in the old church, and I was told I hadn't to move under any circumstances, and through the woods, through the forest coming towards me, there'd be people wanted uh, what was going down to the river bank and uh, hopefully getting across. And I think it was four o'clock in the morning, my Lieutenant Lord come and said, how long is it since anybody well, came this way? About half an hour, sir. So he said, uh, well, you, you can go down to the river now, are you relieved of this post? And hopefully you can get across the river. 
And when I got there, before I got there, I thought there'd be people saying, where have you been? You know, we were waiting for you. When I got to the sandbank, there must have been three to four hundred people milling about. And then the word went round, there's only one escape boat. The others had either been sunk or mechanical faults. And for reasons none of us ever knew, I think about a dozen of us, what said, well, anything's better than stopping here. We're either going to be killed here or took prisoner. And we walked down the river in the same flow of the river, and uh, lo and behold, we found a boat with poor rowing boys in it, you know. And uh, we rowed across and managed to get down with to walk along the muddy river bank, right to where the, there was a Canadian soldier dug in a, a slit trench. And, and at the same time, while this was going on, every now and again from the uh, uh, Nijmegen direction, there was two tracer shells, similar, probably 200 past yards apart. And if you was in, if you could see these tracer shells, that was the escape route. So we knew we were safe. And then we heard this voice saying, "Come on, lads, you're safe now." And and from there we were took to uh, Nijmegen now in trucks. And it, we was all in, as you can guess, was in a weary state. I don't ever remember eating anything at that hour. Uh, two days before we knew we was being pulled out, it seemed that the German commander realised that uh, he had us trapped. So while there was a lot of men attacking us, when he could capture us all or kill us all, without uh, just with shelling. So the, it was a day and night shelling and mortar. And uh, it, it, it's hard to hard to explain how, how bad it is it can be. Now, one incident during the shelling, I knew the, the, the shells were dropping nearby and I was in this slit trench and I heard this terrific explosion. And I just felt that somebody had lifted, up, lifted me up off my feet I backed out then, and when I woke up, I don't know how long I've been unconscious, I realised that uh, I, I, I'd been that near as death as it were possible to be. There's also a bit of humour in, in, in the worst of every situation, and uh, when I woke up, I thought, my back's wet, I must have been wounded, and I went like this. There's no blood on it. I wanted up a shell splinter gone along my water bottle and nipped it and the water was gurgling out on my back. And I wasn't dead. And uh, so, as I said, you can find a bit of humour in the worst situations. But uh, it's a terrible situation when you knew that your chances of either surviving or being a prisoner of war was very, very faint. As I said, when I got to the sandbank, I expected nobody being there. And they were asking me, where have you been? And there must have been three or four hundred men, so it was desperate then because we knew within an hour it would become light and that would be the end of us then. In your mind, you may, and I don't say this easily, you might have thought to yourself, I'm glad it's not me because that's self-preservation, isn't it? And, uh, but uh, you, you realise, you don't, I don't think you really realise at the time when you're talking about, well, I had, as I lived about a mile from here, as I knew it's, we didn't go to the same school, but uh, we, we were school, but I never knew each other, and he got, he got killed. And I thought, uh, that's one from very hot school, that's one less. But, uh, as I say, you, you, you just wait, probably you're, you're actually waiting to be killed or wounded. And you hope that if you got wounded, it wasn't a fatal one. Then you could be nursed back by either the German army or by British army. It's hard to describe what death on the battlefield to me, because uh, it's too, too horrible to think about. The men, 18 year olds, well, they didn't give their life up, they had their lives took away from them. We've been this attack off, and we'd had all, more, three quarters of the supplies what had been dropped from there dropped in the German lines through no communication between ground forces and a, 
uh, aircraft and uh, probably I'd shot this man and he was only like say two or three hundred yards away from me and without having nothing to eat I thought now they've got I wonder if he's got some bars of chocolate what should we oh, oh, anything to eat in his pockets and I can see him now he was laying face downwards on the floor and I turned him over went in his pockets and there was no food and I went in his inside pocket and I can see him to this day and I opened his wallet and there was this photo of him sat down and his wife stood at side of him and two young children at side of him and I said now I've killed somebody what's made, I've made her a widow and two children no father and I quickly put his wallet back in his pocket turned him over and went back and, it, and that's just thing I, I've always lived with I used to think he probably would have done the same with me he was after you train to kill the enemy and you kill him you know and uh, you don't have any feelings about shooting anybody or anything because you know they, they want you, it's either you were him We were got on the cover, took my trucks then to Nijmegen and uh, I think we was in Nijmegen two days. I think it was the first day. I heard these explosions going off and they tell me a German aircraft tried to bomb the, in the dark, tried to hit the bridge but this. And uh, two days then we were took to a place. And I don't know if it's called Laverne or Levine, something like that. And uh, all the all the survivors of the uh, of the battle was it all there and then two days after we went as I said, we went to this Belgium town and then we were flown to the UK and the, the story doesn't end at that because when we landed we should have landed at an airport near Grantham in Lincolnshire where we were stationed in Lincolnshire and the, the pilot probably he got a bit misunderstood and he wasn't too sure where he landed so two or three decoders went down on this other and he followed them down and we was back nearly where we'd started off from at Woodall's Park and uh, so we missed a reception in, as we should have had then so things had gone wrong right all the way along I never went back for 45 years because I think we came to relieve them make them free men and women and children and what did we do what did we fetch them at finish death destruction starvation what would have done if it had been me i probably would never have forgiven them so i never went back for 45 years because i was ashamed to go back what we what we hadn't done for these people and the first year i went back i couldn't believe how wonderful we were reception was. in fact it was embarrassing at times you go in a shop and somebody come and shake your hand and Thank you. Well, and, and an elderly Dutchman once said to me, I think we were in the cemetery, he shoot me and said the same thing. And I said, well, you know, I still can't believe as uh, you forgive us for all that, what we didn't do, what we bought, what they didn't bring to. And he said, yes. He said, what's your name? I said, well, well. he said, one thing you did bring was hope. We knew that we'd not been forgotten. And one day we would uh, be free men again.